representatives to share their experience of COVID-19 and also answer some of the most burning questions concerning the pandemic, particularly from a patient point of view. My name's James Chalmers. I'm the Professor of Respiratory Research at the University of Dundee, and I'm joined by a panel of clinicians and patient representatives from around Europe to discuss key issues uh, around the management and investigation of COVID-19. We're going to have a round table discussion, which means you're not going to see any slides through this session. Uh, but at the end of the session, our panel will answer questions from you, the audience. So please submit your questions through the chat as we're going along. We're going to start the session. We're going to address a number of topics through the session, including acute COVID, long COVID, the impact of COVID on patients with different respiratory diseases. But we're going to start with the discussion of patient experiences of acute COVID. Uh, and so I'm pleased to be joined by uh, Ruud van der Maarde. Uh, Ruud, you had COVID last year. What were your thoughts when you were first diagnosed with COVID? Um, first uh, <clears throat> thought was, Oh gee, uh, help me because I'm a heart patient. I have had one and a half year ago a um, aorta valve replacement, and I was uh, we were we were my wife and I were very uh, frightened to get uh, COVID, and we um, we avoided as much as possible visits to family and other things. I um, decreased. Uh, the people I met uh, in my work. And um, yeah, all of a sudden in November, we had COVID caused by my stepdaughter. <laughs> she took the COVID-19 from her work. And she, uh, because her colleague had, was positive, she went to in quarantine and she had to test and she was positive and then we had to Test also, my wife and I, and um, yes, we were positive as well. And uh, I was pretty sick. Uh, this typical um, uh, in, uh, fever of uh, no uh, muscle pain from uh, influenza was uh, ten days with me. That's horrible. I had uh, three days um, uh, fever. And after 10 days, it was over. But still, I'm still now uh, tired uh, of this COVID uh, sickness. But at the moment that we had it, I, I, when I'm sick, I'm going to sleep, sleep, sleep. <laughs> so I had not so, not so much time to think, but uh, just sleeping. So that's all. So when, when you were first diagnosed, did you feel as if you had enough information? Did you know what was going to happen next? Or were there things that were really worrying you? We, we didn't see any doctor uh, with the COVID. We just tested at a, at a central test center from the um, uh, health service of the government. Um, more or less, I had already enough information about this, uh, this virus. Uh, I'm I may be just a professional in IT, but I know a lot of a lot about uh, uh, the, the the human body and biologics. So I pretty know quite good what this uh, this virus would be, and I'm still still uh, frightened. What, for example, the, the the mutations in India will do will do. This we 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 will not be uh, free of this COVID for the next year or more, I and, think. Yeah, and, and you mentioned that you tried really hard to avoid being infected, yeah. but it's obviously not possible to isolate yourself from the rest of the world. How, yes, how did, how, having made such an effort to avoid infection, how did that, how did that make you feel? Um, yes, yeah, just... Uh, uh, what we missed is uh, in our street, uh, my eldest son is uh, living also here with three children and we missed the contact with the two, three children and uh, right after we were uh, more or less cured from the COVID, we said uh, uh, they, they, they may visit us, it's no problem at all. Uh, so it was, it was a lonely time, more or less. Yeah, very difficult time for everybody. Um, yes. Greatly. Great, great that you're making a, 
a good improvement but you mentioned that you have some ongoing symptoms now yeah. Uh, yeah. can you tell us a little bit more about that um i sleep uh two uh, three, no i'm in bed two or three more hours more we sleep i do not sleep very well and when i am uh, reading in a book or trying to make a website in programming or reading a paper i feel it fell asleep just when it comes, but when I'm doing my, my other hobby, I'm do, doing pottery, I can do everything. I'm not tired, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera but this um, just sitting and reading a book or um, something, I, 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 I uh, yes, yeah, all of a sudden I'm, I'm, I'm sleeping. That's strange. That's very strange for me. Um, and uh, well, further is uh, there is not, not not so much a problem. Yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit more about those long-term effects of COVID later. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, for now, thank you for sharing your experiences. Yes. Okay. Um, we're we're also joined by by Andrea Shanich um, and Sophia uh, Caesar, a nurse and a clinician who've been working during this challenging time. Um, Andrea, for you, what's been the most uh, challenging aspect of the last twelve months? Well, thank you for introductions. I must say that uh, this, when you choose your professional path in nursing, each situation you encounter, you don't consider them as difficulties, you consider them as challenge. And when this pandemic started, we were concerned because when you, it, we were concerned based on, on our experience. When you work in respiratory settings, you know how hard it is to control respiratory viral disease on your ward. So you need to take all necessary measures to localize and minimize potential transfer to other patients and staff. And we did try to get prepared for the worst scenario. Um, challenges were, well, patients are referred too late to the emergency room. That's the main point. The second, patient conditions collapse very rapidly in our uh, COVID wards and IC units. And there is a, a need for continual monitoring. Uh, psychological stress, I need to mention, is very present in nurses. Younger, mm -hmm. younger people die every day, and it's very hard to acknowledge that, and especially when you put so much superhuman efforts and there are no results. Training for nurses is and in that moment, extremely necessary. There was a need to have a knowledge and skills to work in this kind of settings. And clinical cases like COVID demanded experience that in that moment, many nurses didn't have. Uh, I really need to have one statement regarding on behalf of ERS nursing group regarding this COVID. Well, we cannot provide efficient and safe care to all our respiratory patients if we don't have highly educated respiratory nurses. Respiratory nurses need to be next profession to standardize their education, not only at European level, but on the, also on the global scale. If we want to achieve effective and safe care to all of our patients, this pandemic showed what really needs to, what is needed in healthcare settings and in the community. Multidisciplinary teamwork and approach, but to achieve that, you must have allied health professionals who will and can contribute to their, with their expertise. That's a really important message. You you made you made a really key point there about the impact of this from an emotional level on on nursing staff putting in so much effort and often not getting the results. What what kind of support uh, did your colleagues or you find for for that sort of problem? Because that's a, a problem I'm hearing from lots of colleagues. Yes, uh, yesterday I had to talk with my dear friend because with many of my colleagues I call them friend because I have studied them and worked with them. Uh, they don't have any support in our COVID center. Nurses work 20 hour shift, only two days off, they are too tired. Many of them had COVID infection. Uh, so looking every day, people who are very young die, that it's too stressful. So support is not present right now for them. So one of the things we're trying to identify through this discussion is gaps and areas that we need to see more work in. And that sounds like we've identified one right there. Um, Sophia, from a clinician perspective, what do you think has been the, the challenging parts of this year? 
Well, thank you, James, and uh, thank you, the organizers, for inviting me in this uh, very, very important session. Um, the challenges are quite a lot. I will try to focus to the main ones. First of all was the duty towards patients and society to work regardless of the circumstances, providing care and treatment COVID as a 24-hour disease, targeting organ, mental and sleep restoration, because as Ruth said, uh, sleep is important and sleep disturbances also are important, uh, not only during the COVID infection, but in the long COVID uh, uh, syndrome or entity as well. Uh, as you can understand, there were, these demands a high workload to ensure that health services in my area will continuously meet the needs uh, in the same time. The other, uh, the other thing was, uh, uh, the talents to care of myself, my colleagues and our families uh, by protecting all of us from uh, infection along with decreasing fatigue for extended hours of work, coping with moral distress, trying to maintain a fair amount of sleep and avoiding potential legal and professional risks, when we, especially when we ask to work at the limits of our competencies. Uh, additionally, a very important challenge was to maintain as possible diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up of other respiratory diseases, including our sleep laboratory services using, when applicable, e-health services. Of course, nowadays, additional challenges to coping with post-COVID um, uh, situation with a holistic approach from wakefulness to sleep, as I mentioned before. And uh, last but not least, is the balancing uh, work overload with my family and my uh, child care, trying to ensure time for interaction, connection, and activities as well. And this was also an issue for all of my colleagues. Um, uh, that, that was it, the highlights of the most important, as I found it, challenges. Yeah, so I, I, I think all, all three of our speakers, they're highlighting the major challenges across the, the healthcare spectrum from the, the pandemic and many other topics that we could touch on um, if we had more time. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're going to move now to another topic, um, which is how the pandemic's affected patients with underlying health conditions. We already heard from, from Rude about the the isolation that some patients have had to experience to try and keep themselves safe. In many countries, patients have been asked to shield, meaning to stay away from others for very long periods. Uh, and the pandemic has been very difficult for people with underlying conditions in a number of ways. To discuss this further, we're, we're joined by Susanna Lindy. Susanna, welcome. Thank you, James. Um, um, I'm Susanna and I'm a patient with asthma from the UK who's been shielding over the past year. So what has been your experience of shielding, the, the challenges, the feelings about, about that isolation and how that's affected you? Um, well, just briefly, in the UK, shielding guidance um, entailed not going out with your home boundary and um, minimising contact with the people that you lived with. So shielding relating challenges, there were quite a lot of them. So some of them included, but obviously not limited to, um, lack of exercise, which negatively impacts lung health um, and mental health an awful lot. Isolation, which can lead to depression and anxiety, um, and also potentially compromise the immune system because you're not coming into contact with anyone. Um, and from a patient perspective, um, I'm really quite concerned that this winter out with the pandemic is going to be potentially troublesome as many of us haven't even had any colds this year. So we've got a very low level of tolerance to infections. Um, it should also be remembered, it's not just the patients that are impacted by shielding, it's the members of their household as well. Um, they've had to restrict their lives. Um, some individuals have moved out of the house. My son moved out um, for several weeks because he was a key worker to protect the more vulnerable members of their household. So it's a quite a wide impact. However, despite the challenges, um, no doubt the shielding programme has saved lives. Yeah. I mean, how, how practical in the end did you and others find shielding? Because, of course, you can't isolate yourself completely from the rest of the world. You need food, you need some exercise. How, how 
how feasible in the end was shielding for people with asthma, for example? I, I think it, it really depends on your circumstances. I mean, I'm quite lucky because I live in a semi-rural location and um, my lung, my peak flow started going down. My lungs were getting very congested. So I spoke to my respiratory consultant and my GP and I was allowed out um, to go out for some exercise to help clear my lungs. You know, just doing a bit of walking. Um, whereas other people who you know live in high-rise flats and they've got to come into contact with quite a lot of people to get out their property that is obviously far more challenging for them and will have had a much larger impact on them in terms of food deliveries a lot of the supermarkets were very good and offered um priority slots but i know for a while some people were still struggling my local councils delivered food um supplies to people as well yeah so that um, I know you do a lot of work with the British Lung Foundation, so you're connected with other asthma patients. Something that something that we hear uh, anecdotally is that viruses often cause asthma exacerbations, and because of things like shielding, maybe people have had fewer exacerbations. Yeah. Is that something that you've heard as well? Yes, no, definitely, and particularly people that are that their main trigger is viral colds. Um, so, I mean, that's part of the reason that I'm a bit concerned that we're going to have a very difficult winter anyway. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, March 2020, um, I was just recovering from flu, despite having had the flu vaccine. Um, and viruses are a major trigger for me. So, yeah, yeah. Definitely. lots of lung patients as well. Ironically, you know, we've all been. We appear to have been a lot better, but it's an artificial situation because we've all been shut, at, shut away. So what's going to happen when we all come out? Well, we'll know over the next few weeks, but it's spring and summer. So hopefully, you know, we're not going to have a latent cold se um, season. Yeah. So you've got a number of unanswered questions there. And this is a uh, Dragon is a big EU project. All the all the top scientists are watching this session. What do you think are the key questions that that they need to be addressing for for people with underlying conditions like yourself? I think it's quite important to understand, you know, what is our real risk for underlying conditions for people that have been shielding now that we're coming out. Um, one of my, you know, a lot, a lot of us, the medications that we take are now being administered for COVID treatment. Um, is this protective for us? Should we be taking more? Um, you know, what's going to happen in the future? The vaccines as well. I know we're going to move on to that in a minute. But, you know, I think it's quite important for people who have been shielding to have their responses to the vaccines monitored to see, you know, because some people don't respond to vaccines because of the medication that they're on. Yeah, so um, fantastic um, set of research priorities there for everybody that's listening. Um, Sophia, uh, from the from the clinical perspective, um, first, before before I ask you a bit more about asthma and COPD, uh, shielding was certainly a UK sort of approach. What, would, what was the advice in your country to, for people with underlying health conditions about keeping themselves safe? Uh, we, we try to, to maintain as, uh, as, much, as much as we could some connection with our patients that have to be sealed. Um, uh, uh, using e health programs and or door to door activities by, by experienced uh, nurses. However, this was more applicable in more, um, I, let's say, isolated places with less um, inhabitants than in huge areas like Athens. That um, uh, the, the system couldn't uh, proceed like this, but uh, through information, through uh, uh, maintaining contact with their physician, and uh, also providing some, uh, let's say, uh, activities through internet by the local authorities in order to keep them uh, as as much as uh, uh, connected through the shielding and ensure them that they can find answer if they want it for their disease. Not uh, obviously not was the gold standard, but we, we were trying our best towards this. Yeah, it feels like we've done a lot of that in the last 12 months is trying our best to, to deal with a difficult situation. So Susanna's, Susanna's big question there was, what is the risk for patients with asthma and other mm -hmm. underlying conditions? And there are some data on that. So. Um, What's your understanding? What's the latest on, on that in terms of risk? Well, uh, as you, as obviously you know, that there is a lot of debate, but uh, seems uh, to be some more clear data according to last uh, uh, published multi uh, much 
uh, controlled trials, the, the one from the for, from our Boston colleagues and uh, the ISARIC uh, UK study, along with uh, Open Safe Consortium and the, the study used the uh, uh, data by the UK Biobank um, uh, data, showing more or less uh, uh, same results uh, um, that uh, asthma patients with COVID seems to have similar risk of hospitalization and mechanical ventilation as uh, their, co their comparators, and more important, um, showing lower risk of mortality compared to their non-asthma comparators. And uh, that was true independently of the phenotype that they belong to, allergic versus non-allergic, uh, severe versus non-severe. More or less uh, pointing out that uh, if you have a, a well compliant patient uh, with asthma without comorbidities or the comorbidities are very well treated, uh, and uh, the patients were, were compliant with treatment, um, then uh, uh, it, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, this asthma patient uh, can uh, uh, be at high risk to develop severe complications from uh, COVID-19. One of the speculations, not speculations, hypotheses, that uh, they are trying to, to refer to both studies and the ISARIC, and uh, this joined by the very recent stoic uh, fr uh, study from the UK, is that all of inhaled corticosteroids that uh, may play a protective, uh, may prove to be a protective effect towards severe COVID-19 in asthma patients, especially. Um, and uh, given that they protect from asthma, from asthma exacerbations, why not to protect against uh, severe COVID? And there, there are some very positive findings towards this. Uh, however, there is a need for more research. So if uh, an asthma patient uh, is compliant with treatment uh, uh, without any untreated comorbidities, um, can be in the safe side of the road, as, as, uh, as we can say. This is clear in the asthma patients, more or less, not clear, but there are accumulated data pointing towards this. However, the problem with the COPD is not so clear yet because um, ISARIC, as well as Open Safe uh, Consortium, uh, pointed out that uh, COPD patients can be at high risk for COVID-19 severity. However, Open Safe was included general population at ISARIC, uh, CO uh, chronic uh, pulmonary diseases patients instead of uh, COPD, pure COPD. Therefore, we have to be um, uh, um, uh, notified about this. And uh, it seems that advanced ages of COPD with the presence of comorbidities and non-compliance with treatment are the, uh, the factors that can lead to, um, to complications from uh, severe uh, COVID-19. Yeah, so that, uh, and of course, we can uh, further discuss it in details uh, during the question and answer section. Thank you. Yeah, there's a, a huge amount of data summarized really beautifully there. Um, and, and I think the overall message is really reassuring that the, the biggest risk factors for problems with COVID are, are age and, and male sex and, yeah. and asthma and COPD may slightly increase the risk, but have not proven to be as big a risk factor as we thought maybe at the beginning of the pandemic, which is, I think, good information for patients to, to hear. And the role of inhaled corticosteroids, as you say, is a, an exciting recent development. Um, so. Thank you both Sophia and Susanna. We're now going to move on to talk about long COVID, which we sort of touched on at the beginning of this session. So long-term complications of COVID-19 are a key topic for future research, uh, as highlighted by some really big recent studies. For example, the UK FOSS COVID study recently reported from over a thousand patients hospitalized in the first wave of the pandemic, that seven out of 10 patients had not returned to their previous level of health after five months. So that's a really significant scale of the problem. But we still don't fully understand the scale because that's a hospitalized population and the majority of patients were not hospitalized with, with COVID. So to help us discuss this further, I, I'm, I'm joined again by Andrea uh, and also by uh, Susan Williams from uh, uh, Limerick in Ireland. Uh, welcome, Susan. You're experiencing symptoms of long COVID. So tell us something about your experience. Thanks, James. So I was COVID positive in April of 2020 last year. I work as a physiotherapist, so I contracted COVID and work at the hospital. Initially, my symptoms were very, very mild. I did my two weeks of isolation. I went back to work and I felt OK to go back to work. 
But then about two months later, last June, I started developing chest pain and palpitations. So over June and July, I had four hospital admissions, varying kind of five week, five days to seven days, um, mainly for cardiac reasons more than anything. While I was an inpatient, I was in different hospitals, just the way it worked out. I was told I was anxious. It was all in my head that I'm only 23 and this shouldn't be happening to me. I should know better because I'm a physio. But I was still very much having real symptoms. Um, over June, July and August, I spent those three months in bed. I couldn't do anything for myself. Mm. I was assistance for showering. I couldn't cook my own meals. Um, my mood inevitably was really low because I couldn't do anything for myself. <laughs> it's not normal for a 23 year old to be like that. I had the most insane fatigue that I could never, ever explain. I don't think anyone would ever understand unless they experienced it. Um, I experienced hair loss, weight loss, no appetite, I had peripheral pins and needles, um, this crazy brain fog where I just couldn't concentrate. I couldn't remember anything, anything anybody had told me. My short term memory was very, very poor. And thankfully, most of those symptoms have improved. Um, but if you had told me back in April last year when I was when I was doing my isolation that the next few months would plan out like that, I would have told you you're mad and that there's no way. that I just had very, very mild symptoms, so there's no way it would affect me like that. Yeah, well, I mean, extraordinary experience. And you're a year down the line now. Does it feel mm -hmm. like do, does it feel like there's light at the end of the tunnel or are you still <laughs> struggling quite a lot? No, definitely. I have improved a lot in the last probably four to five months now there are still days where I get very very tired and I just need to lie down for a while but I definitely I was better myself at managing it as well recognizing triggers and knowing what makes me better when I need to rest and um, initially when I returned to work I was working four hours a day and I used to have to sleep two to three hours after work just to prepare myself for the next day's work and that has all improved massively but it's just really taking it day by day and if I know I'm going to have a bad day just to kind of pace myself for the day and maybe not do everything I had planned to do yeah, so I'm, I'm going to come back and ask you a few more specific questions about about what you've said there. But I want to bring mm -hmm. in Andrea as well from the, the clinician side. And um, what's been your experience of patients recovering from COVID and your colleagues experience? Yes, thank you for that. Uh, so uh, first, I would like just to mention one study that prediction that approximately 45 percent discharge uh, of patients after suffering COVID will require, require future support from healthcare. And yes, we right now, we can see it in our clinical practice. Uh, number is rising and it's questionable. Will our healthcare system in each country endure that bur burden? Uh, effects of long COVID interfere not only with patients, but also are, uh, reflects their family members. And many of them, as I already mentioned, are young people. So we need to include them once again as active members in community. Uh, I always remember my colleague when uh, he talked, uh, when after his COVID infection, he said to me, he works in emergency room in my clinic, and he said, no one asked me, can I work? No one asked me how I feel. Do I fit to work? So this is very harsh when you expect that someone is going to be in shift and working in the emergency room with all of X, what he has from COVID. And two studies have uh, reported that approximately a third of the patients have low physical performance at discharge and after three months hospitalization from COVID. And I must say that I'm very proud of my colleagues in my department. We started with pulmonary, pulmonary rehabilitation in my clinic last year in November for long COVID patients. We already had 135 patients who finished trainings. And uh, they are in small groups, uh, about 12 to 14 patients, and it's performed each working day, three hours duration in three week period. And before each training assessment is performed, in our team, we have respiratory nurses, physiotherapists, pulmonologists, um, psychologists, and nutritionists. They are all key members that need to be that to work with these patients who have long COVID. And we also have three different halls. The first one is for hospital patients with long COVID. The second is for outpatient. And the third is for lung transplant. We must not forget other patients. So all epidemical measures are present 
So there's no mixing and we work in two shifts. And so I really need to say and give my best to them. They're doing an amazing job in all of this situation. What is the main, uh, when to start with the training? Well, in our clinic, they start six to eight weeks after acute stage of COVID. Optimal is 12 weeks after disease onset. And uh, after training is over, the next schedule for the PR pulmonary rehabilitation is after six months. But in some cases, I need to pronounce it, in some cases, there are patients that are needed for much earlier new training. So patients who need to be prioritized are the ones who were hospitalized and had severe manifestation of COVID. And the waiting list for our clinic is about two months. So. What can we see in practice? Many patients are not referred to the pulmonary rehabilitation programs. In most cases, cases a waiting list is too long. Uh, so in my opinion, we are a little bit late on our response to this whole situation, and we didn't develop necessary measure. Uh, it is possible that this situation will escalate and in the future and represent a huge burden to our healthcare system. Pulmonary rehabilitation is performed by allied health professionals. And I need to refer that we didn't have enough trained allied health professionals in pulmonary rehabilitation before COVID pandemic started. And especially we do not have them now when their expertise is needed more than ever. Yeah, so, I mean, I think that's that's been a huge challenge everywhere has been, you know, this is a new, a new condition, long COVID and organizing clinical services to deal with that. Um, but, but coming back to Susan, I think you said something really powerful, which was that you'd been told that this was all in your head. Um, people really just don't understand this condition. Uh, and that seems to be one of the big challenges. So uh, again, lots of researchers and scientists listening to this who are researching long COVID. Um, what are the key questions you'd really like to see them answered? What answers are you looking for uh, in terms of your long COVID? I think in terms of myself, when I was hospitalized, most of my investigations, bloods were coming back fairly normal. And I, as a physio, knew myself like that. That was great. But I still didn't feel right. And there had to be a reason for that. It took a good few months to figure that out. So I think it's acknowledging that even though your investigations are fine and your tests and your bloods and everything is great, that you're still not feeling OK. And then I think as well, something I would have experienced would have been post-exertional malaise. So anytime I exercise, once I felt better, it absolutely exhausted me. As a physio, I know exercise makes everything better. And I tell every single of my patients, you need to exercise. But for me, it was just the worst possible thing I could do. And as to why is this happening? Because it just goes against everything I suppose that we would normally tell our patients. And then for me, trying to realize that, oh, this is actually happening. And then how do I approach exercise? Or do I forget it altogether? Or do I just do a little bit? And so what's kind of the best way to manage it? And it probably very much is a patient-dependent thing and what your own symptoms are and how you react to whatever form of exercise you do but for me that was a big one that I definitely didn't expect to happen. Yeah so it's, it's really difficult to treat something if we don't understand the biology of it and mm -hmm. you know one of the biggest barriers is that we just don't understand this condition. Um, Sophia I see you've got your hand up. Um, yeah, you if say I something? May, yeah if I may add something to this uh, to, to, to the issue raised by Susan which is very important is that uh, it's not only the biochemical test and the CTs, and uh, of course it's out of great importance that we have to, to, to be aware and follow up, but it's also the mental and sleep restoration and in total the rehabilitation programs. And I think that ERS uh, made an excellent job for uh, providing guidelines for in-hospital patients they have, according to, to what I feel, to expand it a little more uh, and including aspects for in-hospital patients towards sleep maintaining programs and mental uh, programs as well. But also there is a great need for the outpatients after COVID or patients that are not need for hospitalization, and especially for long COVID, what the patient has to expect day by day inform them about how they will cope and where to refer to. It's not only the, the, the biochemical and the x-rays, it's far beyond that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Um, that's been my experience as well. Patients are not reassured by being told that their blood tests are normal when they're still feeling <laughs> awful. Uh, mm -hmm. We have to go a bit beyond that. Uh, <laughs> 
I, I could talk about long COVID all day because I think this is such a key topic and maybe we can continue this in the breakout room towards towards the end of the session. Uh, a reminder, please um, submit your questions through the chat because we'll have a question and answer at the end of this session. But we've got, we've got two more topics to get through. Um, and the next topic we're going to talk about is vaccines. So I'm going to bring back our three patient representatives uh, to get the patient perspective on how the vaccination program is going and how the, the feeling is with regard to vaccines. Um, so we'll, we'll continue with you, Susan, because um, you're, you're both a healthcare professional and, and now a patient. So you, <laughs> you, you have two different perspectives. What, what kinds of questions or concerns have you had about vaccination? So I suppose I was very lucky. I was vaccinated in January being a healthcare worker. Um, initially, my concerns were mainly about how would the vaccine affect my long COVID symptoms? Would it actually exacerbate them? Would it possibly help them? Now, I think it actually has helped them. It may have just been natural recovery, but it, my symptoms definitely have improved since. Um, but I suppose I was never not going to take the vaccine because I, all, I wouldn't wish COVID on anybody. And I definitely didn't want to experience it again. But I suppose the effect on the long COVID symptoms was my, my main concern, really. Yeah, so I've I've heard anecdotally from others um, on sort of long COVID forums and things that the vaccine has helped with the symptoms. Is that something that you've heard as well? Yeah, I know a lot of colleagues of mine who would have had long COVID symptoms as well. Their symptoms have improved kind of two to three weeks maybe after the second vaccine, which is great. <laughs> yeah, it, it's anecdotal, but anything mm. that pr anything that promotes vaccination is not a bad uh, a, a bad bit of evidence to get out there. Um, a, a question to all of you, and maybe we can bring in uh, Rude uh, yes. first. Um, what have been your thoughts in recent weeks as you've heard about the, the side effects of the vaccine and some of the publicity around that? Um, as, as, a, as a patient, how have you been thinking about that and what, what do you feel about the information you've received? Um, first of all, I have got Pfizer last week. My wife, uh, in whose name I'm here, because she has a, a, long, a rare lung disease, LAM, um, uh, is vaccinated by AstraZeneca for three weeks ago, and she will get a second uh, uh, injection in, in some three weeks from now. I will have only one because my COVID, uh, I would say the sickness was uh, less than six months. Um, I. I am, um, 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 uh, I, how do you say that, um, I'm uh, surprised by this, uh, the good working of the RNA uh, uh, in vaccines. And I'm surprised that the uh, old fashioned, as Johnson & Johnson and Astra are, which are uh, based on an on a influenza um, uh, uh, basis, that they have this, uh, this uh, strange um, side effects where Pfizer um, uh, and maybe also I do not know uh, data from Moderna but Pfizer doesn't seem to have much uh, side effects um, yeah and then um, uh, what I uh, what I'm afraid of in the future is that uh, all factions we have, including Sputnik and uh, China virus, etc., cannot handle the new mutations. This one from India, is it, which is coming to Europe already. So I'm, I'm afraid for that. Yeah, so that, that's another research priority that was highlighted in one of the calls, in yes. one of the talks earlier about the importance of understanding how the variants yeah. affect immunity and the, and the vaccines. So Susanna, sort of the same question to you, your feelings around vaccination and, uh, and any concerns that you've had with some of the recent publicity. Um, yeah, I was delighted to get my first dose. I think it was in February. I'm about to have my second one next week. There will always be rare adverse events with either drugs or vaccines. You just need to weigh up as a patient the cost versus the benefit of not getting the illness, hoping that vaccine works in you. Um, 
So that's really my view. Um, you know, I did have the short term side effects, the very common ones of the fever and the nausea. Um, and I had to ramp up my hydrocortisone because I've got secondary adrenal insufficiency. And then mysteriously, a few weeks later, I had a flare up of Ehlers-Danlos. Now, I don't know if that was connected to the vaccine, but I spoke to my GP about it. And it's just something to keep an eye on. But I'm absolutely delighted to have received the vaccine. And actually relating to the, you know, the asthma and the shielding, you know, I I don't know if I'm going to get the booster in autumn or not. You know, they haven't decided. But that's that's a that's a question to the clinicians who's going to be included in that group. Yeah. So d just thinking about that topic of prioritisation, because I know that's been controversial in a number of countries mm. around. You know, who who should get the vaccine first? I mean, Susanna, um, asthma patients obviously were very concerned about their their risk. Have you heard concerns from other patients with asthma about the the sort of prioritization process? No, definitely. Um, you know, a lot of um, asthmatics that you thought, would have thought would make it into priority group six didn't. Um, and then actually some of the guidance that was given on who was to get into priority group six, it seemed actually quite strict. Um, my 20-year-old um, celiac daughter made it into priority group six, whereas her father, who has asthma, didn't, although his, his asthma is quite well controlled. Um, but there was definitely a lot of concern um, among asthma UK patients that they hadn't been included in the group. Yeah, so I mean, I think uh, clearly incredibly difficult at, at the central level to, to get it 100% right in terms of rolling out a vaccine so quickly. Mm -hmm. But I've heard similar concerns from people. Um, what about, you mentioned that your wife has a very rare disease, uh, Ruth. Is, yes. Was that also a, a concern for her around prioritization? Because I guess yes, you can't yes. capture every disease in, in a program, particularly correct. when it's rare. Yes, correct. She, uh, she invited herself via the GP to get uh, an early, uh, an, the early uh, vaccination. And she got from the GP um, uh, this AstraZeneca and in uh, um, she, the, her, her in, um, sickness was pretty mild and uh, she asked uh, the lung department uh, in, in, uh, in Utrecht uh, how that could be and they assume, assume that her medicine for lamb for, for, uh, that she is, she is using um, uh, uh, Lapamycin, uh, that's a, a, a quite heavy drug. Uh, they assume that that will that would have helped her uh, to get a very mild uh, infection. And she is uh, she was very frightened to get it. We got it <laughs> finally, and she is uh, vaccinated. Uh, some six weeks ago, uh, four, three weeks ago, for the first time, and uh, well, we go on now. And but she was in, indeed uh, very keen on getting uh, some priority. Yeah, and that I think the the message that's coming through is a really positive one. As Susanna said, that everybody really wants to get this vaccine because it's the best way to protect you and your family yes. from from a yes. horrible disease. So I, I've yes. been. I've been really delighted. We hear a lot about vaccine hesitancy, but I've encountered no vaccine hesitancy when it comes to this, uh, to the, the COVID-19 vaccines, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, so thank you, uh, Susan, Rude and Susanna, the, uh, for, for that talk about vaccines. The, the COVID-19 pandemic has been an absolute tragedy worldwide. And we see you know, scenes recently from India in particular. It's, it's devastating to so many people. Um, mm -hmm. but, but there's inevitably been innovations, changes during the pandemic that have actually had a positive impact on patient care. Um, it, we've talked a lot about the negatives during this session inevitably, but I, I was hoping we could finish the, the question and answer uh, thinking about some of the ways in which we might have seen some positive developments during the COVID-19 pandemic, because it's always nice to finish on a positive note. So I'm going to ask each of our speakers to just give us their view on uh, one or two things that you take out of the pandemic that you've maybe learned or things that you've done in your work that you think may be positives that we can take forward into the future. Um, so why don't we start with Sophia? Well, thank you, James. It's a very, very, very challenging question. And uh, first of all, I think that um, um, uh, there was a need for a re 
prioritize our uh, needs and our uh, obligations, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, and also find the ways uh, for adapting in the new situation using new technologies in order to be close to our patient uh, and uh, then in general to be patient satirized or human satirized because this is applied to patients as well as to people and our families in general. And um, of course, less traveling uh, may be good for our families <laughs> uh, and uh, for uh, the planet as well, because there is a, a reduction in air pollution as well. But I think that medicine has, um, I think that it's time to, to use new uh, approaches and more patients satirized with an holistic approach to these uh, diseases and discuss more frequently uh, with uh, our colleagues around the world to find the best solution and performing also public awareness in order to, to pass the information. This uh, system with the Zoom, et cetera, helps towards this. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I quite agree about the traveling. Here we are at a conference and none of us have had to travel or stay overnight mm -hmm. a couple of days and, and miss our families. Um, Andrea, coming to you next. Oh, thank you. So for me, when I'm looking for a nursing perspective, I need to say we always focus on education, follow-up, and family support. And uh, all of this crisis has emerged, but the best thing is that we have good examples. We had the sleep and reading conference in the skill workshop where nurses perform trainings virtually to the family, uh, to the patients who have trachostomy. We will have in the next Congress also nursing session where we will see good examples of virtual consult consult consultations, follow-ups. And this is something that uh, I think it's not, we are not living no more in that, that we are expected that patient needs to come to us to the clinic or that we need to come to them. So now we have opportunity to perform everything in virtual way. And I see it as a positive uh, for the both sides. And the second example from the communities, from the friend UK I have heard, they are now giving patients who are newly COVID positive patients pulse oximeter. And I think that's very important, as I have mentioned, that patients are often too late to refer to the emergency room. So checking their respiratory status, level of saturation, amazing example. And I think that needs to be more discussed about it. Yes, yeah, so I completely agree that uh, telemedicine has been turbocharged during this pandemic and is definitely going to be something that's with us uh, into the future. Um, coming to you uh, next, Susanna, as a, as a patient. I absolutely agree with um, the advances and the opportunities in telemedicine and virtual consultations. Um, I have been delighted not to have to go to hospital to see my consultant as much as I like her. Um, but that they, I, th I think video, you know, over Zoom, it would be better than just a, a telephone conversation, but it's, you know, a great opportunity and it's more effective for the patient and presumably for the consultant as well. Um, in terms of telemonitoring, I think, you know, apps, I think in future development of apps that measuring your oxygen saturation, your respiratory rate, your heart rate, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity there because I, I am possibly a little bit late from going to hospital sometimes. Um, and, you know, maybe that could be picked up and I could be told to go or, you know, it could work the other way and declog the system, prevent people going when they don't need to go. So I think there's a lot of opportunity and it can give us reassurance as well. So I look forward to developments. Yeah, so that, that's a really key message endorsement for telemedicine coming through from both a clinician and a, a patient perspective. Uh, Ruud? Yes, I, I, I agree with a lot of things, but I've... I've I have an addition. I see on the road less traffic. And that's a good thing for Netherlands, for Germany, area, because less uh, CO2, uh, less pollution in the, in the air. Uh, and we must uh, learn better and more and more and more for this kind of um, um, meetings uh, to, to do, because that, that's... Uh, that's a big difference in the, in the environment. That's, uh, I hope we will stay. Thank you. 
Yeah, and that that's something that, of course, organisations like ERS have been campaigning about for years, and the pandemic has has brought air pollution into focus in a big way. Um, yeah. Susan, what about from your perspective? Um, I think personally, having been the patient for the last couple of months, it's made me a much better clinician in that I know what it's like to try to sleep in a hospital, to try to eat rotten hospital food, to not really be communicated with by your doctors. And I think communication is probably the big thing as well between patients and their doctors, between doctors themselves, other health professionals. I just, yeah, I can't emphasize communication enough for any clinicians that are listening. It's the most important thing you can do with your patients. Yeah, I think that's that's a wonderful way to to finish this part of the discussion is that even if we don't know the answers, if we communicate clearly, at least mm. we can provide some reassurance and, and care to, to oh. our patients. So I think I think you've heard a lot of great examples of, of innovation there, great examples of where we might be going in the future, things we can learn from the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're, get, we're going to move to the Q&A now. So remember to put your questions into the chat box. I can see we've got We've got a number of questions, which is fantastic. Um, so it's it's open to whoever from the panel wants to uh, wants to answer these questions. We'll start with a, a question from Maria, uh, and this one says, from the patient's point of view, do you consider that information about COVID nineteen individual prevention methods, uh, mainly proper use of masks, was properly addressed by the health authorities? So were you were you comfortable with the use of masks? Did you know what you were supposed to be doing with them? Um, who wants to take that one? Oh, Sophia's got a hand up. Well, um, uh, I think that uh, it is a good question by experience because uh, initially there was uh, a lot of misunderstanding, uh, but uh, that was uh, based on the lack of data that uh, we had to uh, publish data, I mean, in order to be sure about the protective effect of the masks. Uh, but uh, as uh, the pandemic moves and uh, data came out, I, I think that it was clear concerning the masks, the, way, the, the, the protective effect of the masks. However, you have to use it properly. And uh, the other thing is that uh, there, are, uh, there is a need of increasing the warning campaigns to the public as were uh, passing the right message uh, every time. And uh, I think that this is different. Uh, there are huge differences among uh, countries within and outside the Europe as well. But I think that uh, it is proven the protective effect now, not initially. Yeah. Susanna? Yeah, I think the general advice that I got were from two sources. Firstly, Asthma UK's website, which was absolutely brilliant. Secondly, we were very lucky in Scotland that we had a text service that notified us when there were updates on the web, Scottish Government website. We also got, I've got a whole file of letters from um, the Chief Medical Officer of Scotland that were very, you know, it just went through absolutely everything, what you had to do. Um, the only thing I would say about wearing a mask, um, it can be a bit tricky for some respiratory patients, particularly if, if you, you know, if you're somewhere hot and humid, um, it can actually exacerbate your symptoms. Um, but we have an NHS card that shows that you're exempt from wearing the masks. But personally, I try and wear one when I can, but I don't tend to, you know, I've not really gone out much anyway where I need to wear a mask at the moment. Yeah. And so, Rude, the question was specifically looking for the, the patient's feelings on, on masks and how that's been. Have you, how have you, have you been getting on with the masks? We, in, in uh, my wife and I, and uh, our stepdaughter, uh, we are using the mask in the, uh, in the shops, etc. Uh, but uh, my wife thinks it's uh, very inconvenient um, to use it because of her lungs. Uh, she has... Uh, uh, indeed uh, decreased capacity in the lungs um, but yeah you, you, you have to use it uh, more or less I think to protect others not it's um, the mask is not protecting you against things but when you uh, sneeze or some such, such things the mask protects uh, other people from your, from your uh, how do you say that in English? Um, um, Would it be coughing aerosols? Yeah, coughing, <laughs> coughing, coughing <laughs> aerosols, etc. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, but we use it, and a uh, lot of pe most people in in Holland, uh, in the Netherlands, use the the, the masks. 
Yeah, and I, to my impression is that where I am in the UK, uh, adherence to the mask is very high as well. Um, inevitably, we've got a number of questions about long COVID, and I think we'll, we can have a good discussion about long COVID. Yes. The, f the first question is, is from Sapna, uh, and the question is, is there a lack of information and awareness about long COVID? Um, I think we're probably going to say yes to that. And yes. so they've, they've predicted that and said, if yes, who's responsible for making the population at large more aware of long COVID? So I'm going to I'm going to open <laughs> I'm going to open that really to to everybody. How do we how do we get the message out to the public about long COVID? How do we get more action on long COVID? Who wants to go first? I feel like Susan's kind of <laughs> the right person to go to first here. Um, I think it's probably two parts. I think it's partly on the patient to let people know their own story, but then as doctors, clinicians, etc., become more familiar with long COVID to make that more aware to public either through media or whatever kind of source is probably most appropriate. And it's probably a two part role. I know here in Ireland, initially there was like long COVID support groups set up, which was very, very helpful. So, you know, you're not on your own, you're getting no answers, but you know, there's lots of other people with these um, symptoms or experiences. And I know there's a, a specific long COVID physio group set up as well. Again, kind of sharing our experiences, doing different media bits, publications and that so that's definitely helping getting the word out and so one one aspect that's there is the, the the patient side of things but also how do we make clinicians more aware of of long covid sophia i think that it's uh, also a great responsibility and opportunity for scientific societies like prs uh, in a collaboration with others like uh, esrs or something or other uh, societies uh, to group together clinicians, allied health professionals, ELF, because patients are experienced by experience, and uh, uh, along with physiotherapists, that's why I said allied health professional, to perform guidance from uh, uh, not only for organ targeting rest restoration, but with a holistic approach and ways to perform that. So I think that it's collaboration, multidisciplinary um, approaches, uh, working together all these uh, people from clinicians to patients. And I think that uh, ERS has to move forward with this. So Andrea, clear endorsement there of the importance of allied health professionals. Mm -hmm. So do you want to say anything more on, on that and how we how we best best use that to to raise awareness of long COVID? Yes, I would like to mention that we are that is possible that we uh, propose some measures like uh, good practice. So if we know that patient was hospitalized, we can always in discharge letter we always know that physician. But we also we have case here in my country nurses also write discharge nursing discharge letter. We can uh, suggest the patients if their symptoms are merging, are lasting more than three months, are there after are they interfering with their quality of life? Uh, if there are some symptoms, we can put all the symptoms of long COVID and that they are referred to the, their GP or that there are checkups. We already have right now uh, established COVID ambulance. So right now we uh, follow them. We, the assessment is performed. Many of them go to the CT scans to see what's the situation with their lungs. And so it's very possible just there is a good need, need, need for goodwill. And of course, if it's necessary, so we can start with a statement. What is necessary that we follow up each of these patients who were hospitalized and who had severe infection with COVID. So we've got a further question on the topic of long COVID and it's from JC. Uh, and the question is, uh, is it unusual to suffer long COVID after having COVID with mild symptoms? So I, I might start with Sophia here and then ask others, others to come in. Well, um, to my knowledge, there are many data published concerning the outpatient, uh, which we usually are uh, belonging to the mild uh, COVID infectious disease. Um, speaking by experience, uh, when uh, we have to follow up uh, outpatients, um, uh, I think that uh, it's individualized. It depends of uh, patient by patient uh, who suffering from a mild disease if he or she 
will develop uh, long COVID after the 12 months or uh, during um, or up to three or six months. Uh, I think that it's individualized based on potential comorbidities or uh, gene-oriented or habitual or socioeconomical status because this is part of all uh, this as well. And I think that this is another very interesting area that uh, we have to focus on for uh, the next uh, um, uh, years, year or years. It's it's clear Thank that the on, it's clear that the ongoing symptoms aren't just limited to hospitalised patients because Ruda, <laughs> you you weren't yes, hospitalised and you no you, indeed <laughs> uh, and, and yeah, yeah, yeah I can only say yes you you can get it um, maybe Susan said it also you have also a, a, a loss of concentration huh? and um, well you ha can you can get a, some of this uh, long COVID uh, uh, symptoms, uh, not all, of, of course, but uh, um, what, what I have, I have more kilos. Uh, we all have a little bit of that post lockdown. <laughs> we have an amnesty on this call. For yes. That. And, and <laughs> what, what, I, what I was used to do is uh, swimming three times a week, uh, an hour, and uh, since um, uh, the, this lockdown uh, everywhere, the, also the swimming pools were, 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 uh, were locked. So your training is uh, gone. Uh, walking is uh, boring. Um, um, I started, I started uh, last week, I started again with uh, trying to get jogging or uh, slowly, and maybe I get uh, lost of uh, the, the, the kilos, but the kilos is also a, a long COVID problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna give the final word to you, Susan. So with your medical background, I'm sure you'll have looked into this question. So, so what's yeah, the answer? I, I think just the one point I wanted to make, it's really important that we look at the non-hospitalized people, so those people who had the mild symptoms, because I think even personally, I was out of work for five months, that has a massive economic impact. It had an impact on the hospitals I was admitted to. So it's not just a case of me being sick and unwell. It has a greater impact on society as well, economically, yeah. as a hospital run, things like that. So if you imagine there's a couple of hundred people like me alone in Ireland, say, in my position, that's going to have a big impact on the country itself. So I think it's not it's important that we don't neglect, I suppose, those who were not hospitalised with the milder symptoms and how they do longer term. But it can be harder, I suppose, to capture that through research because... You haven't got a set database on them from them being admitted to hospital ever but even yeah that's the main thing i wanted to say yeah and i think that's a really crucial point so many of the patients with long COVID that i'm seeing in clinic were never hospitalized but have now got really severe disabling symptoms so we mustn't neglect that group um so we've come to the end of the session thank you to uh, to the audience for all of those questions thank you to the panel for taking part in the roundtable discussion um can I let everybody who's listening know now you can join an, an informal uh, unfacilitated breakout room to continue these discussions. So the link will be put by ERS in the chat just now. Um, the next session, which is impact in adult patients with premorbid disease and in children, will begin shortly at 1350 Central European time. Um, and with that, many thanks to all of you for listening. And thank you so much to our panel for a, a fantastic discussion. That's been really thank great. You. Enjoy the rest thank of the you. day. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm.